Welcome to the Free Church at Hampstead Garden Suburb. Apologies to those of you who were here at 11 o'clock, but sometimes even the technology gets the better of us. But wherever you are in the world, and whatever time you are watching this, you are very welcome as we meet together to share in this short act of worship. The theme of our worship this morning is comfort. And we begin by hearing these words, selected verses from Psalm 100. And 19. Remember thy word to thy servant, in which thou hast made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, that thy promise gives me life. Godless men utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from thy law. When I think of thy ordinances from of old, I take comfort, O Lord. Thy hands have made and fashioned me, Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. Those who fear thee shall see me and rejoice, because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that in faithfulness thou hast afflicted me. Let thy steadfast love be ready to comfort me according to thy promise to thy servant. Let thy mercy come to me, that I may live. For thy law is my delight. We join together in our prayer. Let us pray together. Comforting God, we thank you that regardless of whatever might be happening in the world around us, you have promised us that you are with us and that you will never forsake us. At times such as these, we need to be comforted, to know that we are not alone, to be made to realise that in spite of everything, there is nothing that you will allow to come between us and your love. As we worship together this morning, grant, O oh God, that we might each of us experience your living presence deep within ourselves. Grant us a sense of peace, peace of heart and mind, peace that the world cannot give, and may each one of us be left in no doubt that you are a merciful, forgiving, gracious and loving God, and that accordingly we are indeed safe with you, come what may. Amen. For our readings this morning, firstly, a passage really read from a part of the Old Testament we rarely turn to, from the book of Lamentations in chapter 1. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people! How like a widow is she, who once was great among the nations! She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night, Tears are upon her cheeks. Among all her lovers there is none to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. After affliction and harsh labour, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed feasts. All her gateways are desolate, her priests groan, her maidens grieve, and she is in bitter anguish. Her foes have become her masters, her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile captive before the foe. All the splendour has departed from the daughter of Zion. Her princes are like deer that find no pasture. In weakness they have fled before the pursuer. In the days of her affliction and wandering, Jerusalem remembers all the treasures that were hers in days of old. When her people fell into enemy hands, there was no one to help her. Her enemies looked at her and laughed at her destruction. Jerusalem has sinned greatly and so has become unclean. All who honoured her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. 
she herself groans and turns away. Her filthiness clung to her skirts. She did not consider her future. Her fall was astounding. There was none to comfort her. Look, O Lord, on my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy laid hands on all her treasures. She saw pagan nations enter her sanctuary, those you have forbidden to enter your assembly. All her people groan as they search for bread. They barter their treasures for food to keep themselves alive. Look, O Lord, and consider, for I am despised. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look around and see. Is any suffering like my suffering, that which is inflicted on me, that which the Lord has brought on me in the day of his fierce anger? From on high he sent fire, sent it down into my bones. He spread a net for my feet and turned me back. He made me desolate, faint all the day long. My saints, my sins have been bound into a yoke by his hands that were woven together. They have come upon my neck and the Lord has sapped my strength. He has handed me over to those I cannot withstand. The Lord has rejected all the warriors in my midst. He has summoned an army against me to crush my young men. In his winepress, the Lord has trampled the virgin daughter of Judah. This is why I weep, and my eyes overflow with tears. No one is near to comfort me, no one to restore my spirit. My children are destitute, because the enemy has prevailed. And then from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, an altogether different tone. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all the saints throughout Achaia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. And we thank God for those two very contrasting passages from his word. Well, Christmas may seem as far away as ever, but this is where I want to begin with the Christmas story. I don't know about you, but I've always been haunted by the account of Herod when he orders his soldiers to massacre all the boy children living in and around Bethlehem, his last desperate attempt to thwart any ambition Jesus may have had to take his throne from him. A desperate man taking desperate measures, the massacre of the innocents. And in his record, of the nativity, Matthew tells of a young mother, Rachel, she who would not be comforted, one of those whose young child had been snatched from her, cruelly taken away, killed before her eyes. No wonder she was not able to be comforted. The reading we heard from the book of Lamentations described for us how it must have felt to live in Jerusalem after the Babylonian invasion. The vast majority of the people had been taken into exile. Just a few were left behind to scavenge in the streets. Jerusalem itself was personified in that reading as one who could see nothing but devastation. No one to comfort her. Where was her help to come from? What hope 
did she have? Well, a generation and more later, her hope would be fulfilled. The Babylonians vanquished, the Persians conquering and allowing the Jews to return to rebuild their city. But at that time, it felt like nothing but desolation. And then on the other hand, we have Paul writing to the Corinthians, reminding them that whatever their hardship, whatever the pain they had to bear, however much the circumstances of life were conspiring to inflict pain and sorrow, difficulty and distress upon them, his first and overriding priority was to comfort them, to let them know that they were comforted. When Jesus spoke to his disciples immediately before his arrest, he reassured them that though he was to be going away, and they found that hard to take, where are you going? Show us the way. These were the questions they had for him, but he had to go away. He had to go away in order that another might come. His promise to them was that after he had gone away, the Father would send the Holy Spirit, described by Jesus as another comforter. I have always thought of the Holy Spirit as God being actively present amongst us, present amongst us as individuals and as a congregation of God's people. And at times such as these, we need to know God's active presence, primarily as the one who is a comfort to us. The pandemic we are presently living through has caused untold sadness for so many. In particular, the circumstances that many patients have been confronted with, but more so their loved ones, denied the opportunity to comfort them and for them to be comforted by their loved ones. So many forced apart at a time when families needed to be together. This has been for so many too hard to bear. There have been too many Rachels not able to be comforted. Yet we are bound to believe that even so, God, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, is actively present in the world as it is today and is reaching out to each one of us as surely as we are prepared to reach out to God. But we should note, being comforted is not the same as being made comfortable. With everything that is happening, it is natural for us to feel uncomfortable. These are troubling times. And we should not be surprised finding ourselves feeling anxious and fretful and even distressed. At times like this, the vulnerability that is at the heart of our humanity can be cruelly exposed. God's active presence is not to be understood in terms of a master magician who, when he waves his magic wand, everything vanishes. And life resumes just as if what is happening now never ever happened. But it is precisely at times such as this that God can be experienced to be present and active within us and through us, comforting us and for being a source of comfort to others. We thank God for his active comfort. And it is in that spirit that we can make our prayerful response. Let us pray together. And in the quietness of the moment, we remember before God all those for whom their experience during this present time is such that they cannot even imagine being comforted. For all those crying for their loved ones, denied the opportunity to be with them at this time, desperate to see their face, to hold their hand, to hug them, to embrace them, to tell them they love them. 
We pray especially for all those for whom an opportunity to attend the funeral of a loved one has not been possible. Those for whom the proper process of grieving has been denied to them. Those who remain unable to come to terms with what has happened. And let us pray for chaplains and other support workers who have done whatever was possible to speak peace to the dying and to comfort the bereaved. Let us continue to pray for all those who put themselves in harm's way that we might be kept safe and well and for all those working to ensure that we can still enjoy a reasonably comfortable standard of living. Let us pray for all those whose living conditions during lockdown are nowhere as near as comfortable as ours. Those with limited living space, with little access to fresh air, with limited finances, with demanding family pressures. And let us pray for the continuing ministry of God's people among, within and beyond their various congregations, providing pastoral care and support wherever it is possible, reaching out to those in need, saying a prayer, giving comfort. Let us join with the nation as over this weekend we acknowledge events of 75 years ago. We call to mind members of our own family who served their country and whose lives were lost in that conflict. We thank you that their sacrifice has achieved for us the freedom we presently enjoy. And we pray for ourselves, that we too might be comforted in knowing that in spite of everything, God is actively present in our midst. And let that indeed be a comfort to each one of us. We join our prayers together in the saying of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so our short service draws to its close. Again, apologies that we were not able to start on time, but we got there in the end. Hopefully, next Sunday, 11 o'clock, we will be ready to proceed. But you never know. But for now, a blessing. A blessing upon us all. That as this week unfolds, that we would again know God's comfort. We hear these words of blessing. Therefore, if we have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then let us make our joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Amen.